tasks, including, including flipping the class and how you can integrate videos in your class. Lots of interesting stuff, which I've already given out and I was not supposed to, so I will be quiet here. Uh, this session is being recorded, so you will have a copy a recording of the session uh, for you to look back. Also, you will be receiving a certificate of participation. Since you're attending this live webinar, if you have any questions at all, you face any technical difficulties during the webinar, please let me know in the chat box because I'm your moderator for today. Equally, we want to keep this as interactive as possible, as engaging as possible. So make sure you use the chat box, interact with the presenter. And Bo, that's all from my side. I can mute myself, but if you need anything, I'll be right here. Thank you so much, Cerise, for that uh, introduction, and and thank you all for for being here. And it's a it's a great pleasure and honor for me to uh, to do this webinar for you. Um, I've never been to your neck of the woods, so to say. I've flown over it when I was a bit younger because I, I visited Australia when I was a bit younger, but I've never really uh, visited your part of the world. Um, so maybe I should do that after this. Um, and uh, someone would like to uh, change his name. Uh, I will leave that up to uh, Sharish. So let me, um, yeah, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and then dive right into the things that I wanted to cover with you. Um, and I'm going to do that in a relatively, I hope, interactive way. So that also, of course, depends on you, the participants who have to interact uh, with me. And I have a couple of tools for that. So let's see if we can uh, get those uh, all working here today. So here's a picture of me. So you have an idea of uh, what I look like. I'm a, I'm a typical large uh, Dutch person, almost two meters tall. Um, and yeah, I've been living in the Netherlands for most of my life, but not all of my life, as you'll see here in a minute. So I did uh, a master's at the University of Amsterdam in econometrics, uh, rather mathematically based. And then I did my PhD in Utah. And uh, that's so I lived in the United States for uh, four or five years. Uh, at, uh, in, uh, in, in Utah, in uh, Salt Lake City, did my PhD there, and then I came back to the Netherlands and joined Nine Rode Business University, where I'm broadcasting from right now. Uh, Nine Rode is a very small uh, and only private university in the Netherlands. All universities are, are government, uh, um, uh, basically government owned, but we are a private university and we are only a business university. And um, I've basically, since I joined Nine Road, I've been an advocate of online anything, uh, anything from teaching to uh, testing. I've also, right when the pandemic started, uh, I did some, uh, did some webinars for McGraw-Hill on online testing and all the pluses and minuses there. Um, and uh, yeah, before the pandemic hit, I was already much, very much an advocate of doing things uh, in a blended way. So not only in the classroom, but also online. And now, of course, uh, most of us ha have a lot of experience or a lot more experience with teaching online than we used to. Um, I also teach typically the courses that students like to hate, things like statistics, um, uh, management science, but also things like uh, operations, supply chain management, uh, research, uh, uh, research for like a thesis and stuff. I've also taught at uh, IPADE in Mexico. I did a, a few years in, uh, uh, in Germany at the GGS uh, school. And currently I'm also teaching um, uh, online courses in, uh, in Utah, as well as in Vietnam. Um, so I'm, I'm in the Netherlands, I'm in Europe, but I teach online courses in the US as well as in Vietnam. So sometimes I really have to, when I get an email from a student, the first thing I really need to think about is, okay, where, where is this student? What time is it for this student? And what course is this student talking about? Um, for McGraw-Hill, I've been a digital faculty consultant since 2016, doing all kinds of things like these webinars, going to conferences, helping people out, uh, uh, particularly setting up things like uh, Connect. And I'll show you what I mean with Connect here in a minute. So that's a little bit of background on um, who I am. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how I teach. Traditionally, and also when I just started here at Nine Road, it's basically, you know, the professor stands in, in front of the classroom and talks and maybe writes some things on the, the blackboard or the whiteboard, and the students just listen. And it's a very comfortable way of teaching because uh, as long as students don't interrupt you, you can kind of get into the flow and you can, you know, you can convey your whole message. But I, I quickly found that this is not a nice way of teaching. Um, first of all, you get very exhausted as the instructor because all you do is talk, 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 and write, 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 write. Um, and that's, it, it just is, it's, it's very exhausting. And, and there is no interaction. And interaction is, I think, the, the key of, of education because that's how students really learn. 
So I, I worked on a educational innovation task force in 2012, 2013. Uh, and we came up with the research, uh, sorry, with the teaching philosophy uh, of Nine Rota, which is less teaching, more learning. And you might see here, there's a couple of capital letters, and that's because at Nine Rota, we are all about leadership, entrepreneurship, and stewardship. So then we said, well, let, let's include that as well. So we have less teaching, more learning, and we wanted to see Nine Rota go more from an offline and transfer of information mode of teaching to a blended and stimulating of learning kind of teaching. Um, again, though, um, before the pandemic hit, not a lot of uh, things happened there in that sphere because we still had uh, colleagues teaching with, for example, overhead projectors, uh, predominantly PowerPoint presentations uh, without a lot of interaction. Um, but now, of course, nowadays, uh, a lot of changes. So actually, in the first six months or so of the pandemic, I saw people making more drastic changes to their teaching style than in the five years before that. I think uh, this will uh, ring true for most of you as well. Um, so anyway, how do I teach? Mostly with flipped classrooms. And so what is a flipped classroom? Well, it basically means that students prepare the materials before they come to class. And so the traditional classroom is where the, the theory is, is transferred uh, by the professor during the session. And then the students do all their applications like problem sets or whatever they do after class. But in a flipped classroom, the students prepare the theory um, beforehand, and the application happens in class. And this is particularly useful for the more, uh, let's say, mathematical kinds of courses, but also for courses such as strategy, um, marketing, accounting, you name it, you can use this kind of setup. So typically what happens, uh, my students prepare in Connect and Canvas, which uh, Canvas you might recognize, that's the uh, learning management system. Um, it's very similar to Blackboard. I think it's better, but some people think Blackboard is better. I'll leave that in the middle. And Connect is, uh, of course, McGraw-Hill's uh, software, which I'll, I'll cover briefly at the end of this presentation as well. So what the students do is they, they, they watch some of my videos that I created, they go through some quizzes, and they uh, prepare the theory and before they come to the class. And then the, the picture as shown here on the right is basically students working on problem sets. And also the same problem is shown here on the, on the big screen. And I'm literally just, I'm not teaching, I'm walking around and I'm helping students out with the problems. Uh, students like to do this, of course, in pairs or in, in, in threes or fours even. They help each other out. Uh, you can walk around as an instructor and, and very quickly figure out, okay, who are the students that are, are, are doing really well? And I make them ambassadors and they can help out their fellow students. And who are students that need more help and I can help them um, more one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. Uh, so it's much more uh, individual kind of teaching. Uh, now this was of course all pre-pandemic and this was all just in the classroom. Um, you can do similar things in online teaching and I'll touch upon that here in a minute. So basically, this is what, what my classes look like. We, we do a, a quick review in class with some interactive uh, Q&As, but uh, let's say it's a three hour session. I used to do theory for about two and a half hours and a half hour of application. Now it's the other way around. I do about half an hour of theory just to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then we have two and a half hours of problem solving. And this is where students really learn and they really enjoy this as well. And then after class, they can still do some extra additional homework um, it can, could, could be in Connect, could be from the book, whatever uh, you want. Uh, but this way, students really uh, understand the material and really uh, practice the material with you there in the classroom. So that's a little bit on flipping the classroom. And one of the things we do then in the session is we review the materials in class through interactive questions and answers. And I want to do something a little bit similar with you. I don't have questions for you that uh, you need to answer right or wrong. I want to just get some of your opinions from you, but it's just showing you how, how you can do this in, a, in an interactive uh, environment. So this is one of the softwares that you can use for this. There's plenty out there and probably the most well known is uh, Poll Everywhere, uh, but we happen to have an, uh, an account with SendSteps. So I would like for you to either scan the, uh, the, the code there that you can see, scan the QR code, or you can go on any device, could be your phone, could be your tablet, could even be your, your laptop you're watching me on right now. You can go to sendsteps.me and then it asks for a login. The login is the word lovely. Uh, or you can just scan the QR code. That's also fine. Then you kind of bypass all of that. And you can see here in the lower right corner that a couple of you have done that already. 
And so the counter will increase as more people join this uh, system. It's all anonymous. I don't need to know your names or email addresses or anything like that. Uh, and you can imagine doing this in class too, uh, either online or in an actual classroom, doesn't really matter. And if we get, uh, usually when I have like 40 or 50 students, at least 80% of them uh, join. So that's, that's typically how I, I, I make it a little bit more interactive and a little bit more fun. And also gives the participants the opportunity to, uh, to vote on, on certain uh, questions. I use it either on the one side for, for questions that, are, that do have a correct answer to really figure out, okay, how do students understand this topic? Uh, do, they, do they really understand it? If, if you know, two thirds of them give the right answer, then I think, okay, they, they, they got it. And I spent just a little bit of time on why that was the right answer and why some other answers might be incorrect. But sometimes I ask a question and I see only like 30% gets it right. So then I know I need to spend a bit more time on that. And one person that to really look for on YouTube videos would be Eric Mazur. I'll put him in the, in the chat here. Uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting person who, who developed basically this system in the 1980s with voting boxes. So you can find some nice uh, old YouTube videos uh, on him uh, showing that. Uh, and the other way that I use it is to just get opinions from participants. Now, I see that we have uh, five of you who, who dared to, uh, to join this system. That's not a lot because I know there's more of you uh, in the meeting. So if you want to join at a later stage, please do. Uh, don't be afraid. I'm not going to ask you to solve mathematical problems. I just want to find out uh, some of your opinions on some things. Uh, and again, these are totally anonymous. So let's go to the first question then that I have for you. And that is, have you ever used the flipped classroom, uh, flipped classroom method before in your teaching? And then you see this question also on, on your device uh, and you can select either A, B, C or D. So you can say, yeah, sure, sure, I've done that and students love it. We can say, oh, I've dabbled with it a little bit, but I found it to be rather complicated. Or you say, oh, I haven't really tried it because I don't know how to do this. Or you can even say, well, I, don't, I still don't really understand what a flipped classroom even means. And then again, in this software, you see, oh, we even lost someone who, who logged out, but we have four people in there. Oh, there's the fifth one back. Thank you. And uh, four of you have voted. Again, if you want to log in right now, you again, just go to sendsteps.me and you can log in with the word lovely. Let's see if we can get that fifth person to vote. There it is. Five people have voted at least. So let's see how this works then, because on the very next slide, we see uh, your responses. Okay. So it looks like of the five people who voted, three of you say, yeah, yeah, I've done flipped classrooms before and students really like it. And two of you say, I haven't really tried it because I don't know how to do it, okay? So this is just an example of how you can make the classes a little bit more interactive because uh, typically as, you know, traditionally what you would do, at, at least what I would do in a classroom is, is I would explain something and then I would ask to the whole group, do you understand? And then there's you know, maybe one or two people in the front row who say, yes, I got it. And then as an instructor, the only thing you can do is say, well, based on the one or two people in the front row who got it, I'm gonna assume you got it. And also people, if they, didn't, if they didn't understand, they feel bad about saying that. So you don't really know if the group understands um, what, what, what you've been talking about. So what you could do uh, better, I think, is ask these kinds of questions. And when, when there is a right or wrong answer, which again, I won't do with you today because of course you haven't prepared any particular theory. Um, but then, then you can quickly find out uh, what people do understand and what people don't understand. So you know what you should spend a little bit more time on and what you should uh, maybe not spend some more time on. All right, and we even got a six person to join uh, the, 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 the answers and says, I don't really understand what a flipped classroom means. Um, so again, that's just where basically rather than uh, you as an instructor doing the theory and then the students at home afterwards doing the application through, for example, problem sets, is that the students prepare the theory on their own beforehand, and then they, um, they then you do the application with them in class. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit different who does what. The, the professor doesn't actually do the theory with the students anymore. The students do that on their own. Okay, so now we've seen one of these questions. So that's nice. So let's talk a little bit about all the different things that I do to make this work. Because you might've heard me mention before that students prepare the sessions uh, by watching some of my videos. And, uh, oh, there's a good question on the chat. Do students remain anonymous in this process with the questioning? 
Uh, it depends. If you uh, set up the multiple choice questions the way I've set them up for today, uh, everything is anonymous because I don't know who voted on what. Uh, but you can also set it up such that it's a quiz in which students can get points for the right answers. And in that case, the, there's also going to be at the end, there's going to be a leaderboard with the top three students. So if you let's say you have a classroom of 60 students and about 50 of them join this system, at the end of the class, you will have a leaderboard of the top three students and those will be on the screen, but everyone else is anonymous and students can even just come up with a nickname if they don't want their if they don't want it to, to, to show as let's say Bo Vandery, they could just say uh, I don't know Pokemon or whatever they can come up with whatever name they want and that could then be their their name that appears in the top three. Um, my experience is students don't mind to be in the top three and they don't mind that their name is up there as long as they're in the top three. They, they don't like to, to have their name up there if they're in the bottom three but it, th th this system at least doesn't show that so a short, short answer to your question is yes, students will remain anonymous in this process. So back to the, back to the videos, because um, uh, for students to really understand the, the theory and understand the materials, um, you could just simply say, you know what, read, read the book chapter five, read book chapter eight, whatever. Uh, for my class, which again is mostly things like statistics, that, that wouldn't work because um, you, you, can, you can tell a student to read a chapter about confidence intervals, but you can't really expect the student to really understand that. Furthermore, if I say read chapter eight, how do I know they've read chapter eight? I wouldn't know, right? Because they could say, yes, I've read it, but I don't know if they've read it. What you can do is create some short videos uh, on these different topics and then attach a quiz question to it so that students watch the video in whatever LMS you're using, either Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, whatever you want, and attach a quiz question to it. And then you know that they watch the video and they answer the quiz question in preparation for the session. Now, a couple of tips and tricks that I found out over the years. Uh, first one here is basically what I do to create videos is I create a slide deck um, basically as, as if you're preparing for a class with one major difference. Uh, because in class, typically what works best is a light background with dark letters, because that shows up really well on the projector. But when people watch something on their screen, it works better the other way around. So for my present, for my videos uh, that I create uh, for, for the preparation, uh, I use a darker background, dark blue, dark purple or something like this, and then white letters, because that pops up much better uh, on the screen. And then basically, what, what do I mean with video? I just narrate the PowerPoint. So I, I go through the PowerPoint, I record my screen and I narrate what's there and I give some more explanation uh, to what's there. And um, this is a lot easier than to also record your whole face because in the end, you're gonna be editing some parts out because you realize, oh, I wanna do that a little bit different. So I wanna edit this out, wanna edit that out. And uh, if, you've, if you've recorded your whole face and you wanna edit out something, then in the final version, your face keeps jumping left and right. So that's uh, that's why I just narrate it. And I do include questions and, and what I would call hooks. So here's uh, just an example. So here's a, a slide of one of my videos that I'm, that I'm editing right now. And you see down here, this is a software Camtasia in which you can, you can edit. And down here, you see all the audio and you see also me in there and you see also me down here. Um, and basically what I do in my videos is every minute or two, um, this person shows up and you can see it's me, but I refer to that person in my case as the lovely assistant, which is also why you logged in with lovely. And the students then also from now on, all my students always refer to me as the lovely assistant. They say, oh, look, it's the lovely assistant. And that's, that's something that's called a hook. It, it hooks the students in and it, it draws their attention to certain things. So for example, if I just explain something really important, I have a picture of me pointing at the left or the right or up or down, and I post that, I, I cut and paste that next to the, uh, the important thing that I just mentioned in the video. And I say, oh, look, the lovely assistant is pointing this out. It must be important. So something that really hooks them in. I've seen colleagues, for example, do videos where their dog uh, is in the video. I've seen colleagues do these where um, they show vacation pictures in the, in the videos or whatever they, whatever they do, but every minute and a half to two minutes, something needs to happen that, that restarts the brain because uh, nowadays with younger students, they, they're, they're engaged for about a minute and a half and then, then they're gone. So you have to really draw them in uh, every little bit, uh, every minute and a half or two minutes. 
So then uh, in the end, after you've narrated the presentation, you can edit the video and you can post it. Again, I use Camtasia as, a, as my screen recorder and editor, but there's many other software things out there as well. I also include moving elements, arrows that fly through the screen, everything like that to, to draw their attention again. Then I post those in, uh, as I mentioned, in Canvas, or again, you can use uh, any software uh, LMS that you want, of course, and, and I attach a quiz question to it. Uh, so to, to ensure that they watch the video and actually uh, answer the question. So let me ask you a, a second question then in the same system that we used before. Uh, have you ever made educational videos before? And it could be, yep, it could be even professional ones in your studio. Uh, he, we here at Nine Road also have a recording studio. Uh, I prefer not to really go in there because then it, it yeah, it, it just becomes a little bit too static because you have a teleprompter, you're reading the text and all of that. Um, but but they will look much more professional than my videos, I will admit. Or you can say, no, it's just me. And I've done this on my own laptop, laptop using screen recording software, such as Camtasia. Or you say, no, nah, I've never made videos because that's a lot of work. Uh, so again, yes, uh, and Sharice is saying, how can you participate? And it's also shown here at the bottom of the screen. You can just go to senseps.me and log in with Lovely. You can still join. But I see we have our, our traditional five people and they're, they're thinking about answering this question now. So let's give them another minute to do that. And it's again, it's totally anonymous. I'm just curious to hear uh, how many of you have done this before. And there we have our sixth and seventh persons. Good, good, good. So we have some more people joining, very nice. And let's see what you guys have done in the past. Have you made videos uh, or not so much? I will say it is a lot of work <laughs> to do these. I've made, I've made probably about 200 videos by now and each video is only about five or six minutes, but takes me about two or three hours to make. All right, so let's see what you guys have voted. There you go. So uh, one of you have actually made some professional videos in the studio at the university. Uh, that's very nice. Um, that's very cool. And those can be very good also for like for online MBAs and stuff like that. Uh, about half of you, that's very nice, have made these kinds of videos. So hopefully for you, some of my tips and tricks were, were useful, but maybe you have some more tips and tricks that you can put on the chat for all of us. And a couple of you said, no, that's just too much work. And, and I will agree, it's a lot of work, but here's the, here's the thing. If you create them well uh, and you spend the additional time on them to make them well, then you can use them for at least five years. Uh, I, I'm still using videos that I recorded in 2014. So that's eight years ago. I've also made new ones. I've started certain ones that I look back and I say, ah, I, I can do better now. I can, I can make this a better message. Um, actually, the whole first generation of videos that I created, I threw out because I made them much too long. I made them like 25 minutes, 30 minutes, much too long. And also I made a very classic mistake and, and let this be uh, maybe my final tip on creating videos uh, to you. Um, I made the classic mistake of including things like page numbers and figures from the book where I said, this is figure 8.1. Because then of course, at some point there's a new version of the book that comes out and the page numbers are all different and the figure numbers are all different. So what I've done instead now is I make videos on topics, not on chapters, just on topics. And I make sure that I don't include figures or things or page numbers from the book, um, just so that when there's a new version of the book that's coming out, I don't have any problems. I can keep using my own videos. Okay, so let that be maybe my final tip on this. And again, if you have more tips and tricks uh, from your side, just pop them on the chat. So then how do I incorporate that? This is just a, a quick uh, a picture again from, uh, from Canvas uh, uh, Learning Management System. So how do I integrate these videos? So I have the video here. Um, oh, and there's a question. What's the difference between send steps and polls in Blackboard? I don't think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a big difference. I'm not 100% familiar with polls in Blackboard, but it's basically uh, same, similar to the, 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 what I'm using. But I, I do think that uh, send steps and also things like poll everywhere, which I also will put here, uh, also check out poll everywhere. That what's nice about them is that they are fully integrated in your PowerPoint presentation. So uh, in Blackboard or Canvas, students can do things at their own time in preparation for sessions and things. But um, this one you can do in real time with them um, uh, during a session. But it might be that uh, polls in Blackboard can do that as well. So if you're familiar with that, just, just use that. 
But then how again do I incorporate the videos in, uh, in their preparation? So I have a video here on a, on a chapter. They can read about the chapter. They can read about an appendix. They can watch the video. This is typically a video of like maybe, uh, I don't know, six, seven minutes. And then there's a question attached to it. And you can make this a multiple choice question or some kind of closed question that, um, that, that, that gives them um, yeah, the opportunity to get some points. Because of course, students will only do things for points, for credit. And in my case, what I've done is the preparation grade is 15% of the course grade. Um, and that's a percentage that came out of about three years of experimenting. Um, so the first, uh, first year, I attached no grade to it. And then I found that about half the students just simply don't do it. Then I attached a grade of 20% to it. And everyone does it. But since this is relatively easy and students also share the, the, the outcomes with each other, the average grade for this is like 95% or even higher. And if that's weighted at 20% of the final grade, that's a little bit high. Uh, and so people got quite high grades, overall grades. So then I lowered it a little bit. Actually, I tried 10% also. And then again, students didn't do it because they thought, ah, 10%, that's not enough. Uh, but 15%, they do it. And it also doesn't um, influence the final grade too much. And there's another good comment on the chat that Nearpod is a nice application to engage students in a survey or do some kind of interactive PowerPoint. I'm not familiar with Nearpod, but I can imagine that it does something similar to what I'm doing with Ascend Steps. Very nice. Thank you, uh, Asim Minu, for that comment. All right, so let's see. Um, yeah, oh, and, and of course, in, in any kind of LMS like Canvas or, uh, or, or Blackboard, you can add feedback to each of the questions. You can, and, and I typically let students take the quiz twice, and then I keep their average score. That's also so they can learn from their mistakes. And recently, I've also basically switched to algorithmic questions or in Canvas called formula questions, because the multiple choice questions, I found that students just share the right answers with each other. Um, so I use algorithmic questions with different numbers for everyone so they can share the method with each other, but not the answer with each other. Uh, just again, making sure that students learn from the experience and not just learn from how do I share the answers and just fill in the right answers. So then the question is, okay, COVID hits, we have to teach online, like we're doing this kind of webinar right now. Um, has my teaching changed a lot? Well, tip, actually, not really. I still teach more or less in the same way as I used to. Um, Again, now in, in the Netherlands, we've gone back to classroom teaching, but also when I was doing online teaching, I teach more or less in the same way. Students prepare. I do a quick review during the session, and then it's problem sets. But of course, there's some differences. Uh, very simply, I cannot walk around. So for that, I use the chat instead. Uh, I also use, uh, for example, breakout rooms a lot, uh, where you put the students in smaller groups and have them work on problems. And then I go by each breakout room. Uh, so I give them, let's say, half an hour to work on a problem set, and then maybe I have 12 uh, groups, so then I visit two or three minutes. I visit every group just real quick to see how, how are you doing. Do you have any questions? Um, you cannot really see what students are doing as well as, you know, as in the classroom. So I also uh, very often would say to a student, well, can you share your screen and see uh, so that we can all see what you're doing? Uh, so I do that as well. Uh, students, it, it's hard for students to help each other out unless you put them in the breakout rooms. But what I do for what I did basically for all my online teaching is I would record the whole session uh, and then I would edit it again. I would edit down, for example, the parts where they went into breakout rooms because that part uh, is not very good for a recording. Um, and I would edit out the breaks and stuff. And so for a three hour session, I would typically end up with a video that's maybe an hour and a half or an hour 45. Um, and I would post that in Canvas or, uh, or Blackboard so the students can see uh, what we've done. Um, and you can also, it's, it's kind of hard to see who is struggling. I think we're all, uh, as instructors, if you have a classroom, even with 50 or 60 students, you can, you, you can kind of scan the room and in just about two or three seconds, you can see the, the, the four or five students who are just totally not paying attention and the four or five students who are, who are struggling and you can help them out. But again, for this, I would ask a lot of questions. I would have them in, in, uh, do the, 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 the send steps questions. I would ask questions that they would answer on the chat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as mentioned, there are some advantages. For example, I would record the sessions and I post this. Students love this. Um, in fact, 
one of my classes, one of the first classes that I taught during the pandemic, which was fully online because we were not allowed to go into the classroom here in the Netherlands, was the highest rated course of all courses over the last 20 years. Because uh, students really appreciated the fact that everything was recorded, everything was posted, everything was shared. And I also found that the chat actually allows for more student interaction. Uh, and I'll have a quick video, uh, video of that here in just a minute uh, where, where I show that. And then also uh, by using software such as McGraw Hills Connect, it basically allows the students to have a little bit of a break. For example, if I tell them you get half an hour now to work on this in your breakout room, students also take that time, rightfully so, to say, oh, I'm, let me just get a, a, a drink, uh, maybe go to the restroom, uh, and, then, and then I'll be back because that's the part of the time that they can work on it, but they can also decide to maybe just you know, have a quick chat. So I also found some advantages of online teaching. And now that we are back in the classroom here, I try to marry the both and, and, and take the best of both worlds. So let me ask uh, this then. I, I think I know some answers already. For example, from Asamenu, who has used Nearpod, and from uh, Khalid, who has used uh, polls in Blackboard. Um, have you ever used interactive questions before in your sessions? Uh, so probably a few of you will say, yep, that's fun. It makes the class more interesting. Some of you might say, well, I've tried, but it never really clicked for me. I never really got out of it what I, I wanted to get out of it. Uh, maybe some technical difficulties, or maybe just that students were not really participating or anything like that. Or maybe you say, well, I'm aware of this now that you've shown me, but I've never really tried it before. All of those are, of course, possible answers. And maybe your answer is not really up there. Uh, just pick the one that's closest to what your answer would be. And I see I got uh, two people voting so far out of the five of you or six, seven that are in the system. So let's give um, the others just another moment to pick the choice that fits them best. Um, and, and already maybe one tip, um, when I have a classroom of let's say 50 students and I have about 45 of them in the system, and if you find on the very first question that students are not really participating, then I just leave the question up I say, you know what, we have 45 of you uh, in the system. I want to get at least 35, vo 35 votes. So it, as long as I don't get 35 votes, I'm just going to sit here. And you only have to really do that once. And then people get into it and they start participating. And then I never really have the problem that uh, there's not enough people participating. And by now I see we got five of you to vote. And there's two more that are thinking about which answer uh, clicks the best for them. So let's take a look. Ah, like I said, very, very, um, very good. Some of you have, have done this before. One of you says, yeah, maybe I had some issues with it before. So it that doesn't really work for me. And one of you said, I've never tried it. Maybe you will after this, uh, this session. Uh, for the person who, who it never really clicked for, I can really recommend that you watch some of the YouTube videos by that Eric Mazur person, because he did a great job on, on explaining exactly how he developed this method and, and how he uses it in the classroom. So that could be a good one to fall back on uh, to make your classes more interactive. So on the right here, you I don't expect you to read this because this is also in Dutch, uh, but this is the chat from my most recent online session, which happened about two weeks ago. And I had, uh, this is about a two hour session. And you can see all the things that happened in the chat because you can see, for example, GIFs coming by, you can see um, emojis coming by, you can see all kinds of comments coming by. And again, this is from a two hour session with, it, there were over 200 students, I will say that, but you can see how many people participated and how much of participation there was, how much interaction there was. And I found out basically that, um, you know, most of us grew up talking to each other, but the students of today, they grew up typing to each other. So if you open up the chat, and be very inviting to, to tell them, okay, use the chat. For example, as you saw maybe earlier in the video, you saw some GIFs come by and you saw some emojis coming by. Well, what I would typically do is I would ask them, for example, a little puzzle, a little question, a little problem. And then with, before I even would give them the answer, I would say, put on the chat uh, a, an emoji or a GIF, uh, how you feel about this question. And then I can see already from the student uh, interaction, I can see, well, some of them were smiling, some of them were dancing, but some of them were crying. So then I would go to that person and say, okay, so I see that you're crying. And they feel it's much easier to express themselves through a gif of a crying baby rather than just, you know, typing in the chat uh, or, or let alone, you know, unmuting themselves and saying, oh, I, I really don't understand this question. 
So if I see a crying baby by someone, I say, hey, I, I see <laughs> your baby is crying. So let me know, what can I do to help you? Um, and can you please text a YouTube video you recommend us to watch? I will do that. Um, uh, I will include that in the PDF file that I'll send to uh, Sherish, and she will include that in the message to you. No problem. I, I have to look it up myself because he, he made like dozens of videos. I'll make sure that I find the right one by Eric Mazur for you to watch. So in any case, I, I found that using the chat in an online session actually increases the level of interaction because everyone is willing to participate that way. And, and this is basically how they learned how to communicate. So a couple of tips and tricks here. Um, I would start by asking some very simple closed questions. And just to give you a very simple example, on this first session I, give, I gave with them uh, two weeks ago, it was on statistics, it was on probabilities. And I would say, for example, uh, if we consider all the possible probabilities for a particular experiment, like flipping a coin or rolling a dice, just a simple experiment, and if we add up the probabilities for all the different possible outcomes, what would then be the answer? And of course, everyone on the chat goes one, 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 and it, it's easy, right? So one, one, one. So earlier in this chat, you might have noticed there were like 20 or 30 people typing one, and that already draws them in. So uh, uh, ask some simple, closed uh, question, uh, questions some, such as one or two, yes or no, blue or red, or something like that. And then you can make it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more interactive by asking uh, for personal views or, or asking some right or wrong questions as well. And as I mentioned already, ask for emojis and GIFs. Uh, give them a small assignment, give them a small puzzle, give them a small problem set, and ask them to express their feelings through a GIF or an emoji. Uh, in fact, the uh, the class that gave me the highest rating over the last 20 years, uh, it somehow evolved into this uh, back and forth between the students and me where they would post an emoji, uh, sorry, a GIF from a movie. And basically I had to guess what movie it was. So they're expressing their feelings through a GIF of someone dancing. So basically they're saying, uh, I got the question right, I understand what's going on. But I also had to get, guess what movie this, uh, this little video was from. And it just became very interactive without the students even saying one word. So that's uh, some tips and tricks there. So then um, on to my final topic here on uh, Connect, which is uh, some software by McGraw-Hill. Uh, maybe you've used uh, other software, online software for problem solving, for uh, problem sets, for puzzles or anything like that. So let me know, have you ever used things like this before in your classes? Maybe you're familiar with Connect and you know what things are like smart book and homework are. Um, or maybe you say, yeah, we, we're using something like this, but just to assign some homework sets, for example. We say, oh, I just uh, use it to share PowerPoint slides. Or you say, nah, we, we just have Blackboard or Canvas, you know, the typical LMS. And that's all I need. I don't need additional software such as uh, Connect on, um, to, to entertain my students during class. Uh, so again, just me being curious about what you're using, what you're familiar with, uh, what you've used before in the past. Uh, not a right or wrong question. I promised you I wouldn't do that. So <laughs> it's not right or wrong. Um, but let's see. We got, to, again, we got about four votes out of seven people. So maybe get one or two more votes, please. That would be nice. And Cherise keeps, getting, <laughs> keeps giving you the, the login information, which is also, of course, on the slide. And there we go, we have five votes. Thank you very much. So let's see. Uh, we see ah, some people of you, uh, some of you are very familiar with Connect because you know what smart book and homework questions are and such of like that. Um, some of you just use it for PowerPoint. And then again, a, a few of you say, yeah, we, we just use the LMS, Blackboard Canvas, that's all I need. And, and to a certain extent, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, if you use the functionalities of Blackboard and Canvas, it can do a lot. Um, but let me share with you a couple of things that things like Connect can do as well. Uh, here's just a quick overview, uh, in my case, again, of a statistics course. Um, if the students click on this menu button here on the left, they get to choose whichever course they're, they're doing. And then the way that I have set it up is for each chapter, um, I have something called SmartBook. And I'll show a picture of that here in just a minute, what that kind of looks like. And SmartBook is what the students do to prepare for class. The practice questions is what we do together in class, and then the homework is what the students do after class. So I very, very consciously make this uh, split where there's preparation before, there's practice during, and there's homework after. And for each chapter, there's always three entries. So it's very clear to the students, maybe the first week they're struggling a little like, okay, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to do all of this? But then very quickly it becomes clear, you do the, the first things before, 
the, the, the middle thing, the practice one we do during class and the homework you do after class. And I do that for every chapter, uh, basically. So what does that look like? Uh, students prepare with what's called SmartBook. And SmartBook is, I would say, a smarter version of a book because what it allows students to do is they, they, they get to take closed questions. Um, but if they don't really know the answer to this, you can click on this reading button and it opens the book exactly on the page that this question is about. So basically what it allows students to do is uh, quickly go through the materials. If they're already familiar with it, they, can, they, don't, they don't really have to even read the book at all. They can just go through the questions. But if they ever are stuck on something like, hey, I don't know what that term means. I don't know what equation to use here. You just go to the reading. It opens up the, uh, the, 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 the textbook exactly on the right page. Secondly, what it does, which is really interesting, is you, you don't just select the answer you think is correct. And sometimes it's multiple choice. Sometimes it's fill in the blank. Sometimes it's mixing and matching different terms and, and their explanations. But it's all closed questions, obviously, because the system needs to be able to grade it. So uh, in addition to picking the right answer, which you hope is the right answer, you get to rate your confidence. And if you rate it at high, and it is in fact correct, then the next question will be more difficult. And if you rate it at uh, medium and the question is correct, then it stays the same. And if you say low, then the question gets a little bit easier. Also, interestingly, of course, if you select the wrong answer and you're highly confident, then the next question gets easier as well. So it's basically adapting to your uh, to your level, uh, which is very nice. And it allows for as many mistakes as you want, uh, as long as in the end you have all concepts, you can see up here, zero of seven concepts completed. For each concept, you need to get two questions right. And as soon as you've done that, you're done. But for each chapter, there's like 200 of these questions in there, uh, all made by the book. The only thing you do as an instructor is you just select, okay, which topics do I want to cover? And then it just pulls for each, for each topic, maybe something like 10 or 20 questions of which students only have to get two right. Um, but they're taking through these questions in an adaptive manner. Also, a nice uh, feature of this is if you got two questions wrong in a row, then you have to read the book. You have to read a page in the book before you can go back to the questions because they don't want you to just guess, 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 guess until you get uh, enough questions right. So this is what's called a smart book, and it allows for very quick and, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, I would say adaptive learning for the students. So students do this in preparation for my class. Then they watch a couple of my videos and ask, answer questions on those. And then in class, we use uh, practice questions. And the practice questions, for example, here's one given. This, again, this is on the statistics topic. Uh, and, oh, wait a minute. I see a good question on the, uh, on the chat. How do you set these smart book questions? Sometimes students get overwhelmed as the questions are so many. One concept tested is many questions. How do you motivate your students to complete it? That is an absolutely crucial and wonderful question um, because indeed, if you just go in into Connect and say, okay, just assign the smart book for this chapter, basically what it will do on average is say something like there's 15 to 20 concepts. Uh, and for each concept, you need to get two questions right. And uh, in total, um, that would take something like two and a half to four hours. So what I do when I go in is I really look at, okay, which of the topics do I want my students to really know about? And typically, for example, for a statistics course at the master level, um, uh, but at a business school, I would not select the ones that are mostly about number crunching or equations. Uh, if I were to teach econometrics, I would focus on those. But if I'm teaching at a business school, I would focus more on the understanding and the interpretation of results kind of things. So I typically select anywhere from five to maximum 10 concepts. And as you do this in Connect, it also will show you the estimated time that it will take students to complete the assignment. And I would like to keep that under half an hour. Uh, usually it's around 15, 20 minutes. Now, does that mean if, if Connect says it's 15 minutes that all students spend exactly 15 minutes? No, some will spend half an hour, some will spend five minutes. That depends on their, uh, their level, of course. But that, that's the way that I do this. I, 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 I select only a very few, five, maximum 10 concepts. Uh, and I make sure that the estimated time, the, the, the time that uh, SmartBook estimates is below 30 minutes. And then they will complete it. So then we get to the class and we do practice questions in class. 
And for this, I select the algorithmic questions. Um, and again, this is for, for more mathematical question, uh, topics. This is very easy, of course. They just change the numbers behind the scenes. Uh, what that allows me to do, if you think back of the picture I showed you of the classroom earlier, uh, I have this question on the, on the board, and they're all working on this question as well, but everyone has different numbers. So students cannot just sit back, relax, and wait for me to fill in the right answer because my right answer will not be their right answer. And I do a couple of these questions, and I would say um, when I started with this, I was trying to overdo it. I was trying to do too many questions. And basically at the end of the session, students were thinking, oh my God, we did so many questions, I don't remember. So typically what I do now is one question per half an hour. And that's, for me as an instructor, that's tremendously slow. Like if I were to do, this is only half the question, by the way, there's also a point two down here below. But if I were to do this question myself as an instructor, maybe take five minutes and I'm done, maybe even less than that. But I want students to struggle with it. I want students to figure out, oh, this is what I'm doing wrong. I want the good students to help out their neighbors. So I take half an hour for a question that takes me less than five. So in a typical class where I said I have like a three hour block, I do about half an hour of theory at the beginning with the sense of questions to make sure everyone's on the right page. And then the last two and a half hours, I do four or five questions. And it sounds like that's not a lot, but I'd rather have students walk away with, okay, I really understand the things with, that we've done, uh, even though it was not a lot, uh, rather than you know them walking away saying, oh yeah, we did 10 questions, but I don't recall anything. I, I haven't really learned anything. So that's the practice questions. Um, and then they do the homework after. And the homework questions, I typically just select questions that have the exact same numbers as in the book, because there are still some students who say, I would like to just do it from the book. I say, OK, then just go to these questions in the book. Uh, but what I will do in Connect is I will scramble the order of the questions uh, within the chapter, because I don't want them to know when they're reading the question that, OK, this is from 4.1, this is from 4.2, this is from 4.3. So I scramble the order of the questions. And then finally, what I do uh, in uh, behind the scenes as an instructor, I can keep track of two important things. And uh, you can keep track of everything, of course, but the two things that I find most important is I track on the homework questions, because remember the practice questions in class we do together, but the homework questions they do after the, the session, I track of the homework questions, which ones they struggle with. Now, clearly in this case, you see three questions here, and you see the percentages that they got in the first attempt and also the final attempt. These questions I'm fine with. As long as they score over 80%, they're fine with it. But there's also occasionally a question that maybe scores like a 50% or even lower. And those are the questions then that I spend more time on, either in an additional uh, session, like an additional tutorial, or maybe I make a video on it, or maybe I just post the solution in Canvas or whatever. But I spend more time on the questions that they struggle with. The second thing that I keep track of is something called the online engagement indicator. And that is a combined score in Connect that tracks how well students are doing, but also how much they're doing. So it's a, it's a weighted average of how many times they log in, how many pages they watch, how many questions they do, and to what extent they do them correctly. And I wrote a white paper on this uh, together with McGraw-Hill. And uh, one of the results then from that white paper is that I can mix and match the online engagement indicator from the students with their exam results. And that's what this graph is showing. On the x-axis, it shows the online engagement indicator score, which varies somewhere between one and 10. One means the student hasn't done anything in Connect. 10 means they've done everything in Connect. And then on the y-axis, it shows the exam grades. And for me, in the Netherlands, we, we grade exams between a zero and a 10. And also important to mention is that a five and a half is a pass. So if you have a 5.5 or 55%, then you've passed the class with the lowest possible grade, but you've passed. And if you have a 10, then, then, then you're basically perfect. Now, of course, we see a widespread in these dots because students come from all kinds of backgrounds. They have uh, you know, males and females, international uh, Dutch students, uh, people coming from a trade school, people coming from an academic uh, previous education. People have done statistics a lot, people who have not done statistics a lot. But it turns out of all the variables that I can put in the regression, because of course, regression is also part of statistics, the only one that always comes out as significant is the online engagement indicator. 
Sometimes gender is significant. Sometimes age is significant. Sometimes previous education is significant. Uh, sometimes work experience is significant. Sometimes being a national or an international student is significant. But always the online engagement indicator is significant. And I track this for all kinds of students. As you can see up here, these are the number of students that I've, I've used Connect for. I did an analysis of about 500 students in six different groups. And basically, I found graphs like this. You can see with the green line is that the exam grade increases as the online engagement indicator is higher. Now, Charesse also has this white paper, so she can include this for you also in the package that she'll send you. Uh, and one of the takeaways was that if you have an online engagement indicator of only two, so you've barely done anything, then there's a 40% chance of passing, so getting a 5.5 or higher. Uh, as, as the online engagement indicator goes all the way, let's say, to an eight, so you've done a lot of work, then you have a 75% uh, chance of passing the exam. So it's almost doubling your, your chances of passing. And I see another nice comment. I agree with the result as I did the same study in my course. Very good. The more students engage in learning tasks, the higher the grade. The learning analytics data in Connect is amazing, particularly if you teach a common course in large classroom. Absolutely agree. Um, and, and so, of course, we all know as students are more engaged and they do more work, they do better on the exam. We all know this, but we have now we have data and we can prove it. And I've done that uh, with a bunch of data in, in the white paper that, uh, that you guys can read about later. But thank you, uh, Asamenu, that you have a similar experience. That's great. All right, so that brings me uh, to the end, actually, of my session. I only have five minutes left. It was all about time management. So I think we've managed the time pretty well. So I'll just uh, recap very quickly what we all talked about. And, and if you have any more questions, please post them uh, on the chat as well. So what did we all talk about? Well, I talked a little bit about flipping the classroom. Uh, I believe it makes for more fun classes, classes with more engagement. And it also, very importantly, increases the student learning. Talked a little bit about how you create and integrate uh, videos. And I gave you some tips and tricks that hopefully will help you. Uh, we, of course, did a few of those interactive questions. Um, the way I do them, they're integrated in the PowerPoint. Um, for today, we use them mostly for getting your opinions and getting your, uh, your experiences. But I, in my typical classroom, I would use them more for like right wrong questions to figure out to what extent students understand um, the topic at hand. We talked about how to use the chat and actually that the chat allows for more interaction than a typical classroom where students have to raise their hand, et cetera. I would suggest you use mostly closed questions for people to answer on the chat with very short answers such as one or two or yes or no. Um, and ask uh, students uh, feelings or opinions through emojis and GIFs. I also shared a little bit about Connect, how I use that in preparation and problem solving during the session, as well as tracking their performance during and after the class. Um, so actually what we didn't really talk about is how you improve your time management skills. But I think by applying all of these different things, uh, particularly the, the, the flipped classroom method where uh, if students prepare the theory beforehand, you have a lot more time to actually practice the materials in class, um, then you're not going to run out of time and you're not going to go over time and you actually get to cover what you wanted to cover. So that's me. Uh, thank you very much. And just a, a final tip, perhaps, before, if there's any questions on the chat, again, just put them there. But a final thing that I also did, um, if, just in case we ran through this too quickly, I had a final question prepared for you, which I don't need to have to do now because we only have two minutes left. Uh, but then I could have spent a little bit more time on one of these topics, for example, how do you record and edit a video, or how do you create an interactive question, or how do you use Connect functionalities? I could have gone into those uh, pay websites or into the into the send steps to show you these things. Uh, but again, I just kept that, you know, uh, for me at the end, just in case it was only uh, 45 minutes into the session right now, we could have spent about another 10 or 15 minutes on that. But since we are out of time, uh, I would like to thank all of you for your uh, participation, for your interaction, for your voting. And I hope that you got something out of this. Um, and yeah, as a menu I did, so thank you very much. Uh, and Ravish also, very nice. So thank you very much. And we will share all the materials with you. Uh, Sharice will come back to that. Uh, we'll, we'll get in contact with you. And if you have any questions, you can also just email me uh, at b.vdre at nineroda.nl. I'm always open to uh, emails. Um, the call button, nah, don't call me, just email me. That's much easier. So thank you very much, people.
Thank you, Bo. That was a wonderful webinar. Honestly, I learned so much myself. I didn't know about steps as well, by the way. Uh, so that's a new one for me as well. Good. Ten steps. Um, and I, if there's lots of great stuff you covered. I think my favorite, and I know we're out of time here, so I'll be very quick. Um, my favorite was just making sure that you have something there to make a hook with the students. Make sure they are there with you and following along. Uh, thank you so much. And everyone says thanks a lot. Thank you so much for being a fantastic audience. I'm going to drop a link for other professional development uh, webinars that McGraw-Hill is currently running in case you want to register for any of them. So you can go ahead and register. And funny thing is we do have have a similar webinar tomorrow that's for time management uh, however that webinar is going to be by randy it's at 5 p.m to 6 p.m ksa time uh, if you register there you, you will get a uh, link and you can attend the webinar test tomorrow uh, same topic by the way time management but different stuff um, see you there until next time thank you and have a great day bye thank you everyone bye-bye